Um, I am the Chief Executive Officer here at Hyperscience. Uh, we're discussing AI and automation predictions in the short term. And by the short term, I mean what, are, what is going to be on the mind of leaders next year, uh, in 2023. Gartner says that um, the automation industry or uh, spend on AI in um, uh, large enterprises is about $60 billion, growing at about 20% year on year. The things that I want to discuss today is what's going to change in the way that people allocate that spend, what's going to be on people's minds as they think about artificial intelligence, uh, AI software in 2023. There's five predictions that I want to discuss here today. So let's get into it. So the first of it, which I have already spoken to probably five folks in this room, and I think this is one that will no doubt resonate with almost everyone, is onshoring. I think the first change we saw in this, in sentiment, was really a movement towards some degree of what I would refer to as nationalism uh, in 2015, 2016. Um, in America, this represented itself as a desire to bring manufacturing and other things back on shore. In the UK, um, with Brexit, uh, we saw a desire for more ownership over rules and regulations and laws and trade uh, um, that want to be brought back on shore. I think during the pandemic, we saw how important control over things like IP, supply chain, data really were. I hear onshoring of key workforce members that need to be extremely knowledgeable in one area and low cost labor maybe isn't getting them what they need. Certainly IP, uh, we've seen uh, at the, in America a massive push for bringing intellectual property back onshore. This is a push at a national level. I think that's going to happen globally. A stat that I heard recently that I find just fascinating is that 90% of microchips are developed in Taiwan. Um, that right now happens to be a very geopolitically tough uh, region of the world. Um, what does that mean for our cars, our computers, our fridges in some instances, uh, our planes, the weapons that we defend ourselves with from a, a, a domestic perspective? That means there's a lot of dependence in areas that maybe companies and countries aren't happy. And I also think um, you'll see data coming back on shore. So this change is happening. Um, what it will happen, and I was speaking with someone earlier that phrased this very well, is that'll require the cost of labor to go up relatively substantially for uh, companies over the next few years. That has to pair with some ROI. It has to pair with better revenue or better labor productivity. And I think labor productivity is one of the key levers that AI um, uh, and automation software can help drive forward. So that brings me to the second uh, for, uh, prediction of two, which is what I refer to as the augmented employee. The idea that you can take a piece of software and you can make a uh, knowledge worker a back office worker, a data keyer, whatever it is uh, that worker is doing, substantially more productive. When I speak about labor productivity, it is the, just the number of hours worked or the cost of that relative to the output uh, that is achieved from that. And uh, for many reasons, recession, onshoring, uh, desire to be competitive, there is a need for that uh, labor productivity. And technology has most always, mostly always been the answer to that. The article that I thought phrased this best, and it's in this, um, uh, or the title of it is in this uh, uh, pre-read, is an article in the New York Times that uh, um, spoke about uh, augmenting uh, employees versus replacing employees. And the story I really liked in that is one about radiologists. So for about five years now, um, AI has been able to detect diseases in, in, in scans far better for simple diseases than a highly trained, expensive, educated radiologist has. And for a while, the prediction was radiology uh, as a career will go out of place. Over that five-year period, um, more radiologists in the US exist today than did before, uh, are paid a higher sum of money uh, than were before. And this, the phrasing that I really liked is, the question is no longer when will uh, robots replace ra radiologists, it's when will radiologists that use robots replace radiologists that don't. Uh, and that's what I see as a sort of big change here. Um, and the last thing I like to say on this one is, 
there's not a single industry I'm aware of right now where there's more supply of labor than there is demand of labor. And that's crazy to say as we're on the brink of a recession, which I think we are, but even if we're not, it's kind of crazy to say. There is just more work to be done than there is workers to do that work. Our job is to make uh, those workers more effective. Um, the third one is return on investment. When I speak about ROI, um, I mean two things. The first is revenue. The second is cost, obviously. And from a cost perspective, this same report found that 10% uh, of organizations found that AI software drove 10% decreases in their cost basis. Now, ROI, I've split it uh, in this um, uh, document into short term and into long term. Short term uh, ROI is things you're going to see in a year to two years. These are things that uh, people tend to greatly care about um, uh, and enjoy seeing the reaction to. Longer term is just sort of five to 10 year investments. I think what you've seen, if you've seen, you have to pick between one or the two of those. And I think with the recession, with where we are from a product development perspective in, in AI and ML, you're going to see that trade-off no longer needed. And you're gonna find projects that have short-term ROI and long-term ROI. Obviously, bottom left is don't invest whatsoever uh, or cancel those um, uh, investments. That can be tough, but it's the right thing to do. When you have one that pays off in the long term only, I would encourage folks to really invest in ma milestone management. This is when we say we're gonna deliver this, do we actually deliver this? And when it doesn't happen, you've really got a question, is this the right technology? And then for short term only, I, I suggest that that is not a great area for investment. Um, you need a future, pre 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 a future proof piece of technology. So a change in the way we think about ROI is the third investment or the third uh, theory. Um, the fourth here um, uh, is uh, around narrow um, applications of AI. We've seen over the last 20 years artificial inte intelligence massively develop. I'll speak about a few milestones here. The first really started in 1997 with chess where a piece of AI could beat a uh, chess master. That was where it really started to get interesting. In 2012, you saw the mach machine visioning allowing the detection of cats, which seemed to be very interesting at the time. Software could uh, uh, identify cats extremely reliably. And 2022 was one that I found <coughs> fascinating, which is um, a developer entered a piece of art into an art competition that was developed by an application called Mid Journey, uh, entirely AI generated, and it won that art competition. And at the end, uh, this uh, artist, quote unquote, revealed that it was entirely AI generated. It's not a real piece of art that any of us would hang in our living room, but it is a fascinating demonstration of natural language processing, taking a very unstructured sentence written in a very, very human way and creating art out of it. But what you see with all of these settings, and now I'll uh, come back to AI in the enterprise, is they are very specific. You can't take learnings from one data set, from one application and apply it to another. That's when you start to get into AGI, artificial general intelligence. And we've seen no ability to do that. You can't take a chess uh, uh, set of algorithms and have it play Go and win that game. A very simple change is an entirely different data set that you need to drive that. So what does this mean for all of us when it comes to software, uh, to AI software in particular? It means, uh, and I was talking to one of our customers today about this, it means that you should pick vendors that do a very specific thing. So that's the prediction there, that it will remain narrow and that a lot of these vendors that have been committing to widespread automation change without specializing will probably go out of business in the next few years. The last one, and then I'll wrap it up here, is my prediction on regulation. Um, it, people have talked about regulation for a while, uh, and it hasn't really happened. In fact, at Hyperscience, we're starting to self-regulate to some degree because our customers care greatly about it. So we started an AI ethics committee uh, a couple of, um, uh, about six months ago now. That looks at use cases, whether they're right or wrong. A lot of our use cases are very simple thing, loan origination, 
uh, claims processing, customer onboarding that have very little controversy around them. And then as you sort of work with governments and there's a few other use cases, you start to get into spaces which is, should companies be using AI for this or not? I think those are very interesting discussions. But you're starting to see a lot more government regulation. The White House in the US put out a blueprint for regulation. Um, that is just the start of a discussion. You're starting to have uh, the big AI companies write letters of what AI should be used for and shouldn't be used for. And the really interesting area, I think, is data sets when it comes to biases. Should we use, uh, um, or when we use data sets that maybe very clearly bias uh, giving a mortgage to one profile of person versus another profile of person that may be based on income or zip code or something, but actually the machine interprets it as based on race or the length of a name or something like that. How, what does that mean for um, uh, products going forward? So those are the things that those are the two things I think people really need to have on their mind as they think about AI regulation. Um, the one prediction I have here is that AI regulation will be extremely local. Uh, and that'll be very interesting. It'll be probably the first point we've had that, which is that companies will be re regulated in very different ways and countries will regulate in very different ways. And the question that we'll all have is when one country, let's say China, takes a different view on regulation to another country, let's say America, or you can imagine two competing companies, what does that mean for competitiveness? What does that mean for fairness? What does that mean for biases? Uh, and I think that'll be a fascinating thing that we'll, we'll be exploring over the next uh, couple of years.